good afternoon to everyone i welcome all of you to the 70th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics bharati dasan university with the support from rusa 2.0 it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker dr marcel novius from brazil dr novius obtained his phd from university of sao paulo at sao, at sao carlos in the year 2003 He carried out his postdoctoral studies at Unicamp for a year, Brazil, and another postdoctoral work at the University of Bristol, England, for another three years. He was appointed as a professor at Federal University of Sao Paulo, Sao Carlos, in the year 2009, and moved to Federal University of Uberlândia in the year 2014. Since then, he is working at the Institute of Physics, Uberlândia University. at various capacities dr novius working in several um so um good afternoon to everyone I welcome all of you to the 70th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the Department of Nonlinear Dynamics, Bharati Dasan University, with the support from Rusa 2.0. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marcel Novius from Brazil. Dr. Novius obtained his PhD from University of Sao Paulo at Sao Carlos in the year 2003. He carried out his postdoctoral studies at Unicamp. for an year and another postdoctoral work at the university of bristol england for 3 years he was appointed as a professor at the federal university of sao paulo in the year 2009 and moved to federal university of uberlândia in the year 2014 since then he is working at the institute of physics uberlândia university at various capacities at a novius working in several topics in physics including semi classical approximation random matrix theory scattering and quantum transport in chaotic systems at novius has supervised several phd students and organized several workshops and conferences in the research topics which i mentioned earlier with this short introduction now i request dr novius to deliver his lecture over to you professor thank you very much um let me thank you for uh, this invitation and this opportunity and uh, i'd like to thank everybody who uh, showed up and i hope you can uh, learn something and find something interesting okay i'll try to 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 give a a very accessible talk without many technicalities uh focusing on the ideas okay so if i can uh, share my thing um can you see my talk yes yes okay so i want to talk about the random matrices in quantum chaotic scattering so what is that about okay so chaotic scattering here i give you some examples of uh, chaotic systems So um, chaos is uh, actually a very common property of dynamical systems. You don't need a very complicated system to in order to have chaotic dynamics. So here I give you three examples of um, simple uh, integrable regular systems, which is which um, are uh, billiards. So this is the the blue line is a a region in space. inside of which you have a particle moving freely so is the particle in a box but in two dimensions basically and so this is as simple as it gets in terms of dynamics it's just a free particle and it bounces around it bounces on this this uh, uh boundary okay the blue line so if you have a circular boundary this motion um has conservation of angular momentum and it's integrable if you have a square boundary or a rectangular boundary you also have a very simple motion 
And if you have an elliptical boundary, you also have very simple motion. So this, these are two, um, three examples of integrable dynamics. They have conserved quantities. But if you change the, the shape of the boundary just a little bit, so if you say, combine the square with the circle, and you restrict the particle to move inside the square, but outside of a circle, this is called a Sinai billiard. This is already a chaotic system. Um, this is a so-called stadium billiard, where you have um, uh, a square, but then you add uh, circular wings, let's say. This is also uh, a chaotic system. And this is called the cardioid billiard because it looks like a heart. And it's also a chaotic system. So it's these are uh, very simple examples of chaotic dynamics. And just to show you that it's very easy to, uh, to have a system with chaotic dynamics. And But uh, I want to focus uh, not on closed systems, but on open systems, so scattering. And um, you can have, for example, um, say you put three uh, circular ob obstacles and you can have a particle incoming from the left and then it bounces around. It hits these obstacles many times until eventually it's it uh, goes away, right? So for the time that the particle remains in this region bouncing around, it has a chaotic dynamics, right? It's not uh, infinitely long in time, but it still has some chaotic properties. Right? This is a very open system. You can have a system which is not so open so that the particle stays longer. So it, let's say you have a stadium billiard but you add small openings, right? So a particle that uh, enters the billiard from one of these openings is gonna bounce around for a very long time uh, before it eventually goes out, right? So this is what I have in mind, these open systems, so scattering, transport, something comes in and later it goes out, right? Um, the simplest possible difference between the closed systems and open systems is the a classical time scale called the dwell time, which is roughly is uh, on average how long does a particle stay right in the chaotic region, right? So this is a property of an open system which does not exist in a closed system. It's a main uh, main characteristic of an open system is the dwell time. And the existence of this time, in a sense, simplifies the problem because now um, extremely long orbits are exponentially suppressed. Namely, it's uh, very rare that a particle will experiment uh, uh, an extremely long orbit, right? Because, of course, uh, if the orbit is, too, is, is much longer than the dwell time, uh, it likely uh, will not happen, so the, the particle will, will leave. And extremely long orbits are the main complication of a chaotic system. So because the, the particle in an open system doesn't stay for very long, then in a sense the dynamics is kind of simpler, all right? So that's basically uh, the setting. So uh, even though uh, so far I'm only talking about uh, particles and, and the dynamics of a point particle, I actually have in mind a scattering of waves and mainly uh, scattering of quantum waves. So I'm thinking of the, this particle is an electron, right? It's described by some wave function and we wanna talk about scattering of waves, okay? But since I also wanna talk about chaos, which is a classical, property, we need to consider the semi-classical limit. So when h bar is very small, okay. So we're going to describe the scattering in terms of so-called scattering matrix. Um, so we, we want the limit or the regime where h bar is small because I wanna see um, classical properties, chaos, you know? At the same time, we want long dwell times. So I want the particle to spend relatively long time in the system because 
if it stays uh, for too short a time, it will not experiment any chaos, right? So you need it to stay for a long time so that it develops a very chaotic dynamics. So not too long, but not too short, okay? Longish dwell times. Uh, these two limits actually, in a sense, they compete because um, you have uh, a quantum time scale, which is called the Ehrenfest time, which is like a coherence time in a sense, which is um, inversely proportional to the Lyapunov exponent, which is a measure of how chaotic the system is, and the logarithm of h bar. So if h bar is really, really, really small, then you have a, a large Ehrenfest time. And that means that a wave packet will follow the classical trajectory. So um, then in that case, you don't really have um, interference because the wave is concentrated on a, on a classical trajectory and it doesn't spread. So that's not what we want. We want the wave to spread all around the system and interfere with itself and give rise to complex behavior. So we don't want a very large Ehrenfest time. So we want the dwell time to be larger than the Ehrenfest time. And actually in everything that I'm gonna talk about, I just consider that uh, the Ehrenfest time is zero basically. So as long, uh, as soon as a, a wave starts traveling in the system, it spreads everywhere and um, it interferes with itself and it develops complex behavior, right? I, we're not interested in the situation where a wave is localized and follows, uh, you know, moves around like a particle. That's not, uh, that's not the point. But uh, corrections that involve this, the ratio between these two times, they have been studied, but we will not consider that. So we just consider that the dwell time is much longer than this other time. Uh, we're going to describe the process, the scattering process. So a wave comes in and a wave goes out, right? And this is described by the so-called S matrix. What is the S matrix? So you have an incoming wave and you have an outgoing wave. And the Schrodinger equation is a linear equation. So you have a, a linear relation between what comes in and what comes out. Okay, and the matrix that um, gives you the, the outgoing waves in terms of the incoming waves, this is called the S matrix, the scattering matrix, right? So it relates incoming amplitudes to outgoing amplitudes. So basically uh, you have some incoming wave, you have uh, outgoing waves and um, matrix elements of this S matrix will tell you precisely, you know, how much of the incoming wave is scattering into, into a certain direction or into a certain uh, quantum state. So let's assume some finite dimension. So I have, uh, let's say, um, you can uh, scatter in, you can, the outgoing wave can scatter into a certain number of possibilities, right? It can go this way or this way or this way. And you have, let's say, uh, some finite number of possibilities, and then uh, the S matrix will have that dimension. Let's call that N. Right? The S matrix must be always unitary. This is for conservation, right? So you want the, the norm of the wave function to be preserved because that's the probability uh, that the electron, let's say if it's an electron, is going to be measured somewhere, right? So um, the probability of being measured uh, must be conserved, or if you want, the mass must be conserved. And this um, is translates in terms of the S matrix into a condition of uh, unitarity. Right? You can have, for example, let's say a chaotic cavity, like a billiard, the one as I showed at the beginning, and you have an opening, like a wave guide that, that um, allows waves to, to come in and come out of this cavity. And this wave guide, this lead, this wave guide, it has some finite width. 
And then you have quantization of transverse modes, and this gives rise to uh, a finite number of finite number of channels. Um, so you can uh, the wave can move inside the waveguide in the in the fundamental state or in the first excited state. You have this quantization, right? Uh, so that given the energy of the wave, it's going to have a certain number of channels it can uh, move through. So the higher the energy, the, the larger the number of channels. So this is the basic situation. And the idea is that if you have chaos, if you have a chaotic cavity, you expect universal behavior. Namely, um, the quantum properties of, that you can measure from the system will not depend much on the precise shape of the cavity. If you change the shape a little bit, it should not change much uh, the observables, okay? Because basically, you know, two chaotic systems, even though they are they can be uh, different, they will have basically the same properties. Okay, that's uh, the expectation. Yeah. So, in a in a generic system. Let's say what do I, what do I mean? Uh, some chaotic system which I do not do, I do not know the shape of it. All I know is that it's chaotic. So the S matrix that describes this system is going to be a, a very complicated matrix. I cannot predict it. Right? It doesn't have any simple structure. And in particular, if I change the shape a little, the S matrix changes a lot because it's very sensitive. Okay. So in this sense, uh, the S matrix should be like a random matrix, but it has to be unitary. So a random unitary matrix. So basically it's going to be a matrix uh, with unpredictable elements so that, you know, in some sense, these elements that behave as if you are just sampling them at random. Okay, so if I take one cavity, I will have one S matrix. If I take a slightly different cavity, I will have another S matrix. If I take another cavity, I will have another S matrix. And if I look at these S matrix, they would just look like random matrices. You know, there is no, uh, there's no simple structure to them. So what does that mean exactly mathematically to be a random unitary matrix? That's not, um, I don't want to make the talk too, too complicated. So I just say, you know, uh, it's somehow, it's like a random matrix. Okay. Uh, you may have some structure due to symmetry. So if the system has time reversal invariance, so if, um, um, if, if the scattering process is equally likely to happen in the reverse direction, so if you, Let's say if you tape it and then you play the movie backwards and you cannot tell, um, you know, you, you cannot tell that it's going backwards. If it, the going backwards is acceptable, that implies that the S matrix should be symmetric. So you then you have a, a matrix which is not only unitary, but also symmetric. So it's an extra structure. And these are so-called circular ensembles. So ensembles of matrices, um, it, it can either be the unitary uh, ensemble or the orthogonal ensemble, and they are both called circular. So circular unitary and circular orthogonal. That means uh, a random unitary matrix and a random symmetric unitary matrix. Okay, that's the, the terminology here. And that's, uh, so that's like a statistical, statistical theory, right? This theory usually simplifies when you consider a very large number of channels, as us usually the case with random variables, right? If you have, a, let's say, if you throw a, a coin a very large number of times, you can expect, you know, that uh, half of the throws are going to be heads, half of the throws are going to be tails, right? So you have laws of large numbers, and the statistics, uh, you know, it, the average is uh, is predictable when you have a large number of samples, right? So this is a you know basic principle of statistics. 
and it still holds here. But the only difference is that now our random variables are not numbers. Our random variables are matrices, which is not surprising because we're talking about uh, quantum mechanics. So the position of the particle is, a, is an operator, is a matrix. So if you want to say that your particle has a random position, this must be a random matrix, right? Uh, let me uh, do some propaganda for my book that was published a few years ago. It's called Introduction to Random Matrices and uh, uh, it's directed at the people who are reading about it for the first time. It's very introductory. Okay, okay. so let's say we have this uh, random unitary matrix. So what exactly are we talking about? What can we say about random unitary matrices? So unitary matrices form a group, right? A Lie group is called a unitary group. And that's uh, a lot of structure, right? Forming a group tells you a good deal. So there is a lot of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of knowledge that we have about groups in particular, we, the unitary group is one of the most studied and better known groups. So we know, for example, that there is only one uh, positive invariant measure uh, normalized on the unitary group. It's, it's just called the invariant measure or the Haar measure. What does that mean? Is that um, you associate a certain probability with, a, with the matrices or probability density say how likely it is to, to take a matrix at random, right? And this distribution is invariant under multiplication, okay? So the, the measure of the product of two unitary matrices, if let's say you are considering U to be a random matrix and V to be some fixed matrix. So the probability, of taking u at random is the same as taking u times v at random. So multiplying by a, multiplying by a, a fixed unitary matrix is uh, leaves the measure invariant. So the more easily said, the the measure is rotation invariant. Okay, because the unitary group is the group of rotations. Right? Um, so. Uh, we have uh, also in group theory, the whole theory of uh, irreducible representations. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but it boils down to the fact that um, we have something called the characters, which are functions on the group. And these functions are uh, orthogonal. So you have this function S lambda of U is a, a family of functions. And if you take two functions, from this family, say S lambda and S mu, and you compute S lambda at U and S mu at U uh, dagger, U conjugated, and then you integrate U over the whole unitary group. So you compute the average value of the product S lambda S mu, the result is zero unless uh, mu is equal to lambda, right? So it's an orthogonality property of the, these are orthogonal polynomials, these S are polynomials. It's just orthogonal polynomials, right? Uh, these polynomials are known as the true polynomials. And the, the label here, lambda, is a, an integer partition. So it's a, a list of integers that sum to a certain, certain value, right? So for example, uh, say uh, number four has uh, five partitions. It can be written as four. It can be written as three plus one. It can be written as two plus two. It can be written as two plus one plus one. And it can be written as one plus one plus one plus one. So you have five partitions for the number four. So that's, uh, that's what, how partitions work, okay? So given a uh, integer partition, you have a sure polynomial, which is a function on the unitary group. And they have this uh, very important property that they are orthogonal. This, so this is, uh, comes from group theory. Um, and this is a formula for the sure polynomials. Uh, it's not very important, just, uh, just so you know. It's the sure polynomial 
in n variables, which are um, the eigenvalues of the matrix U. So it depends only on, you know, the sure polynomial evaluated at a certain unitary matrix, it depends only on its eigenvalues. And given the n eigenvalues, it, you can compute it by computing the ratio of two determinants. The determinant of a matrix whose elements i, j is the j eigenvalue raised to the power n plus lambda i minus i. This is in the numerator. And in the denominator, you have the so-called van der Monde determinant, which is the determinant of the matrix whose elements i, j is given by the j eigenvalue to the power n minus i. So it's not uh, too complicated. Right. If you know the eigenvalues and you have this uh, integer partition, you form this matrix, compute the determinant. You form this other matrix, compute the determinant. You divide these two determinants, and the result is going to be the sure polynomial. Uh, they have this important property that they form a basis for the vector space of symmetric polynomials. So any symmetric polynomial in the eigenvalues of U is a linear combination of sure polynomials. So they are complete and orthogonal. So that's a, a very good properties for a basis, right? Um, OK, so this allows you to uh, do integrations over the unitary group. That's the idea. So we are doing statistics, right? We have the S matrix, which describes a certain physical system. We are saying that this S matrix is like a random unitary matrix. So if I want to compute some, some average, right, some average property, I will have to average over all possible unitary matrices. That means I have to do an integration over the unitary group, right? Can we do integration over the unitary group? Yes. For example, using sure polynomials because they are orthogonal. So if you have a quantity, if you have some symmetric polynomial in the eigenvalues of U, you can write it as a linear combination of sure polynomials. And once you have done that, integration is easy because they are orthogonal. That's what I'm trying to get at here is how to compute average quantities uh, that depend on random unitary matrices. But OK, this beautiful theory, which is uh, basically representation theory, it, it only works if you have symmetric polynomials in the eigenvalues of U. But maybe you don't have a symmetric polynomial in the eigenvalues. Maybe you have some matrix elements. Right? So we can also do integration involving matrix elements. So if you want to compute the average value of a project of matrix elements, so something like uh, product over k of u, i, k, j, k, conjugate of u, p, k, q, k. Right? So you have, let's say, five, el five elements of matrix u and five elements of matrix u conjugated. Uh, you multiply all these elements, and you want to know the, the average value of that. OK. If I take U to be a random matrix, right, and I compute this project for all these random matrices, uh, what is going to be the average value? So we have a, actually a formula for that. Uh, it's zero, mostly. Uh, it's the only possibility for it not to be zero is if the indices have some structure. So the list of P, P indices must be a permutation of the I indices, and the list of Q indices must be a permutation of the list of J indices. So that's uh, these two delta functions here. That's what they do. Okay, so delta sigma IP is one if P is a permutation of I given by permutation sigma. So sigma is a permutation. So if P is, uh, is equal to I permuted by permutation sigma, then this delta is one. So the delta tests uh, whether there exists a permutation connecting these two lists of indices. 
and then you must uh, you must test for every possible permutation. And the permutations have different weights. So the weight is given by the so-called Weingarten functions. So you can have a one permutation connecting i and p, and a different permutation connecting j and q. Let's call them sigma and tau. And uh, if you know these two permutations, then you can compute this so-called Weingarten function. Um, I don't want to explain too much about this because it's rather complicated. Um, I just want to tell you that we know how to compute these average values. There is a whole theory, there are formulas, and uh, this is uh, under control, and this is how you compute average, average values. A different, uh, so this is um, all about S matrices, which tells you, um, given an incoming wave, how is this wave scattered? And how is it going out? A related question is about so-called time delay. So how long does it take for the wave to scatter? Right? Of course, this is not a very simple question because um, it's hard to talk about time in quantum mechanics or, or in wave scattering in general. Right? But let's see what we can say about this. So vaguely speaking, quantum amplitudes, they tend to be of this form. So semi-classically, a uh, certain quantum amplitude this goes back to Dirac and Feynman and these guys, is the exponential, well, even, even older than that, of a, of, a, of a complex number, which is basically uh, imaginary unit I times energy times time divided by Planck's constant. Okay, just vaguely speaking, right? So given this, time would be um, if you take the derivative of S with respect to the energy, right, you get S itself. And then if you, if you are uh, taking the derivative with respect to energy, you will have I T over H. Then if you, did, if you multiply by the complex conjugate, you cancel the exponential. If you multiply by minus I, you cancel the I. And if you multiply by H, you cancel the H and you are left with T. Right, so just you know, vaguely speaking, given this s, if you compute this quantity, this would be like the time. Time would be something like this. Let me just check, everybody. Can you hear me? Because sometimes I lose connection. Yeah, yeah, we are hearing you, sir. Right. Okay, good. And this, uh, if s is the scattering matrix, then this quantity is known as the Victor Smith. Time delay matrix. This was uh, developed by Wigner, Eugene Wigner, was Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist, and uh, Smith, uh, way, way back, I think uh, maybe in the 50s, maybe the 60s. Okay, so, uh, so you have this uh, recipe for uh, given the S matrix, you compute this other matrix, the Wigner-Smith matrix, which in some sense um, is related to, to the time, to the duration of the scattering, of the scattering process, right? Okay, so now uh, in our theory, our statistical theory, S is a random matrix for, for fixed energy, for, for each energy, right? I have a wave coming in with some energy, it scatters, at that, at that energy, right? The scattering is uh, elastic. Uh, and the matrix that describes that, which is the S matrix is random. But all of this is at, at a fixed energy. But Q requires the derivative with respect to the energy. So now you have a, a difficulty, right? Because if all you know about S is that it's random, how can you possibly compute the derivative, right? This is meaningless. So you need a, a new theory. So there are basically two, two things you can do if you want to discuss time delay. 
first thing you can do is to try to model the S matrix as a function of the energy. So instead of just saying it's random, you, you try to say something more, right? How does it depend on the energy? This approach is sometimes called the Heidelberg approach. And basically, uh, it starts with this expression. You write the S matrix uh, in terms of the Green's function, which is the inverse of the Hamiltonian minus the energy. And then you couple, if you had a closed system, this would be the Green's function. So the propagator at finite, at fixed energy. But now you have an open system, so you have to open this. You open it by this matrix V. The, this matrix V is a coupling of the scattering region with the outside world, right? So you basically what's going on here is V couples you with the outside world. So it lets in a wave coming from, from outside, lets the wave in. Then you have the Green's function, which promotes propagation inside the scattering region. And then you have this other matrix, conjugate V, which couples you to the outside and lets the wave out. That's basically uh, what's going on here. Uh, and in this way, you can relate uh, the scattering matrix with the energy, all right? Uh, there is another difference also that um, now because the, the system is open, the Hamiltonian, this is the Hamiltonian, it is not a Hermitian, right? Because it's, the system is open. So it has a, an imaginary part, which is uh, proportional to the coupling to the outside. Okay, as much, if the coupling is zero, then the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. If the coupling is, is not zero, the larger the coupling, the less Hermitian is the Hamiltonian. Basically, this is the Heidelberg approach. And now you can consider the Hamiltonian to be a random matrix. Right. This, uh, taking the Hamiltonian to be a random matrix is the, now the, the statistical approach. So now you have two ingredients, right? You have chaos, which makes the Hamiltonian random. And you also have coupling with the outside that gives you the S matrix, but now you have the S matrix, which is, is still random because age is random. So S is also random, but besides the randomness, you have a dependence with the energy. Okay, so this is a very powerful uh, approach, very powerful model called the Heidelberg approach. And so, and this is one way uh, of doing it. I don't know very much about this. I've never worked with the Heidelberg approach. I just wanted to mention it to you. Because there's something else you can do. You can try to circumvent this problem, go around it. Uh, and uh, instead of trying to model S as a function of energy, you try to model Q directly as a random matrix, right? I mean, since S is a random matrix, the derivative will be random. S adjoint is also random. So Q is random, right? So I can just start from that. The Wigner-Smith matrix is a random matrix, okay? And let's just forget about the S matrix. Let's say, you know, I don't know much. I don't know the derivative of the S matrix and I don't care. All I know is that Q is random. So let, let's just, you know, Let's just model Q, replace Q by a random matrix directly without the worrying about uh, this derivative. Is that possible? Yes. For a given energy, Q is like a random matrix, right? It behaves like a random matrix. What kind of random matrix? Unitary matrix? No, right? The S matrix is unitary. The Q matrix is not unitary. The Q matrix has two properties. First, it's Hermitian. And second, it's positive because you know it represents time, it represents the duration of the scattering process and the duration has to be positive. You cannot have negative duration. So it's Hermitian and positive. And we know that um, it is distributed 
uh, so-called inverse Laguerre ensemble. What does that mean? Well, if you remember Laguerre polynomials, ln alpha of x, this is a family of polynomials with an integer index and a real parameter, alpha. And the basic property of the Laguerre polynomials is that they are orthogonal with respect to the measure proportional to x to the power alpha e to the minus x. Okay, Laguerre polynomials, uh, if alpha is zero, you just have the exponential measure. These are the most ordinary Laguerre polynomials. And uh, when alpha is not zero, you have so-called generalized Laguerre polynomials. And they show up um, in the solution to the hydrogen atom, for example. They also show up in the solution to the three-dimensional uh, harmonic oscillator. So Laguerre polynomials are very well known. And uh, okay, the basic property they have is that they are orthogonal with respect to this measure. So when I talk about the Laguerre ensemble of random matrices, what I mean is the matrix, I take the same measure basically, but it's now a matrix measure. So the probability density of getting a random matrix from this ensemble is proportional to the determinant to some power alpha times the exponential of minus the trace of the matrix. Okay, so this is, this is the definition basically of the Laguerre ensemble by analogy with the Laguerre polynomials. And why do I say inverse Laguerre? Because it's the inverse of the matrix Q that has this distribution with this exponent alpha related to the number of channels. You remember that we had this, uh, the number of channels and the symmetry. So whether uh, you have time reversal invariance or you don't. Okay? And so depending on that and depending on the number of channels, you have this uh, a different parameter alpha. How did we know that the matrix Q has this distribution? I don't want to explain because that would be too complicated. I just want to tell you how it is, okay? So if you, if you have a, such an ensemble, you have a matrix with this distribution, then the distribution of its eigenvalues, which are a list of N um, positive real numbers, it is obtained, it's basically the same, but you have um, you have an extra factor, which basically is the Jacobian of the transformation from matrix elements uh, to uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you are diagonalizing the matrix, right? This distribution is for the matrix, so you can imagine it's the distribution for the matrix elements. And then when you diagonalize, instead of talking about matrix elements, we're talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So diagonalization, right? The matrix, the, the measure doesn't depend on the eigenvectors. It depends only on the eigenvalues. Uh, but you have the Jacobian of the diagonalization transformation, which is the Vandermont, raised to a power beta, which is uh, one if you have time reversal symmetry, and two if you don't have time reversal symmetry. This is called the Dyson parameter in honor of Freeman Dyson. Now, once you have the, the, the joint distribution of the eigenvalues, so the eigenvalues are, are uh, random variables, but they are not independent. They are correlated random variables with a pretty complicated distribution, okay? It's uh, the joint distribution is the product to some power times the exponential of minus the sum times the Vandermont to some power. So you know, pretty convoluted distribution. Once you know the distribution of eigenvalues, you can then compute uh, many average things. So, you know, what is the average of the trace of the, of the time delay matrix, which is called the Wigner time delay? What is the average of the trace of the square? What is the average of the square of the trace and things like that, which would be physically would be correspond to the average time duration of the process, uh, the variance of the duration, and you know statistical statistical properties of 
you know, we are considering the duration of the scattering process as a random variable. And then we are computing its, its average, its variance, its statistical properties, moments. So you can compute moments of the matrix uh, using this distribution. And it, this can be done using the theory of Jack polynomials, which are um, generalization of Schur polynomials. We cannot talk too much about Jack polynomials. It's a very interesting subject, but a bit complicated. Let me mention, uh, so far I have not talked at all about any of my, my own work. This is just an overview of the theory. Excuse, excuse me, Professor, I have a question. Yes, absolutely. Um, so is there any connection between inverse logger and some uh, polynomials and the sure polynomials? Whether this inverse or logger polynomials are subcases of sure polynomial? Is there any connection? Uh, are they totally different uh, polynomials? Uh, they are different. So the Laguerre polynomials, they are related with this measure, which is a measure on the half line. Yeah. And the Schur polynomials are polynomials that are the, the natural measure for them is a measure on the unit circle in the complex plane. Okay. Um, so here I just wanted to cite information, one of my recent papers just for this year, which is time delay statistics or finite number of channels in symmetry classes, which is basically what I'm talking about here right now, using Jack polynomials uh, to compute properties of uh, time delay, basically. Um, another interesting thing is when you have two openings, so you have an incoming wave from one side and outgoing wave from another side, then you have two different uh, numbers of channels. In this case, the S matrix will have some block structure, so we have some reflection block, which tells you how much of the wave incoming uh, from the first uh, hole or the first waveguide is reflected to the same waveguide. This block will have dimension N1. And then you have a transmission block, which tells you how much of the wave incoming from the first waveguide is, is scattered through the second waveguide. And this is a transmission block. In this situation, um, you can then compute uh, uh, another matrix called the transmission matrix, capital T, which is T, T dagger, which has dimension N1. This matrix, of course, by the construction is Hermitian. And uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix, they represent probabilities, basically transmission probabilities. And they are in the interval 0, 1. So basically, you know, they are probabilities. So, uh, what is the probability uh, that if you come from a certain channel, you will be scattered into another channel, something like that. And then you have, again, uh, statistics, right? You have moments. You have, for example, traces of powers. And these statistics, they characterize the transport. So uh, if you, of course, if you take n to be zero, uh, you raise a matrix to the power zero, that's the identity, trace of the identity is the dimension. So the zero order moment is the number of channels. The first order moment, which is the trace of the transmission, is the sum of the probabilities, is like a total probability. This is called the conductance of the system. And the second moment is related to the, something called the shot noise. So basically, if you have a electric current flowing here, quantum quantum, uh, quantum electric current. Uh, the electric current will fluctuate in time just because you have some, uh, some probability that the electron will be transmitted or reflected. So, uh, these numbers basically measure uh, the statistics of the electric current. So basically the average current and the variance of the current. So this is actually, you can measure this in a, using uh, electronics, uh, semiconductor electronics. When S is a random unitary matrix, T is in the so-called Jacobian sum. So in, uh, again, with, in analogy, 
So the Laguerre ensembles, the Laguerre polynomials, they live on the half line, and the Jacobi polynomials, they live on a finite interval. They are orthogonal with respect to the measure um, t to the power alpha, one minus t to the power eta. Uh, and t must be between zero and one. These are, so the Jacobi polynomials, that's where they, they live, that's how they work. And again, uh, here is basically the same, this matrix T in the so-called Jacobi ensemble for which the measure is the determinant of the matrix to the power alpha, determinant of one minus the matrix to the power eta. And these parameters, these exponents, alpha and eta, again, they are related to the channel numbers and the symmetry. Okay. So you know how T is distributed. Then you can obtain the joint distribution of eigenvalues which again is the same times this Jacobian, which is the van der Mond. So the eigenvalues of T are random variables, correlated random variables with this distribution, complicated distribution, but you can compute things. And so you can compute the, the conductance as a function of channel numbers and symmetry. You can compute the shot noise, you can compute conductance variance and all kinds of, uh, I just put some formulas here, just uh, let's not to go into too much detail about them, just so you can have an idea of what it looks like. Uh, you can compute all kinds of quantities that characterize the transport, right? So how much, uh, uh, how much transmission you have, how much reflection you have, how much noise you have, and so on. Okay. Then you can, uh, uh, another characteristic that you can treat is uh, to include tunnel barriers. So when a wave or when a particle arrives, it may be reflected straight back. This is um, an attempt to be realistic because when you build this, systems in the in the laboratory um, you you want to send an electron into a cavity sometimes you cannot you know sometimes the electron comes back so you have to take this into account because the coupling is not perfect okay you have to you know you have these contacts and uh, uh, the you know the transmission is not perfect and sometimes when you send an electron in it doesn't go in. it comes straight back it gets reflected without even entering the cavity. So this is not, uh, a, is not a chaotic process at all because it's prompted reflection. The electron comes, it doesn't go in, it comes straight back. So this is not chaotic. So you have to do now something, you know, something different. Now S is not a random unitary matrix because, because of the direct reflection, which is not random. So uh, now the, S is not a random unitary matrix. It has a, a different distribution, which is known as the Poisson kernel, which is a, okay, it's some complicated formula depending on the, on the determinant of one minus R S, where this R is the reflection matrix at the barrier. So if this is zero, then you have the usual, usual thing. And if it's not zero, then you have this, this new distribution. Now, this is much more complicated. It's a much more complicated situation. And so in this case, we know the distribution of the S matrix, but we don't know the distribution of the transmission matrix or the time delay matrix. So one thing we can do is perturbative results. So let's assume that R is very small. And then we can do perturbation theory. So just to mention another paper of mine with the Rodriguez Perez, Marino, and Vivo, uh, statistics of quantum transport in weakly no ideal chaotic cavities. So you have this problem here, but it's weak. Okay. Uh, when you have this uh, tunnel barriers, why do I call it tunnel barriers? Because the electron, it only enters the chaotic cavity by tunneling through this obstacle. You need the tunnel effect. In this case, you have progress coming from a different theory which is semi-classical approximation. Again, let's not go into details. There's a whole theory 
of the semi-classical approximation. Basically, the idea is that you write the elements of the Hamiltonian or the S matrix, you know, the quantum observables in terms of classical dynamics, classical quantities. So basically, you have a number beta, B, B, which is the stability of an orbit. Gamma is a certain classical orbit, classical trajectory. You have to measure its, its stability, which is related to the famous Lyapunov exponent, and the action, which everybody knows is integral of PDQ. Knowing these two quantities, you can then uh, compute matrix elements of the matrix S in terms of classical, so classical sum. So if you are scattering from incoming channel to some outgoing channel, you have to sum over all the classical trajectories that uh, that enter the cavity in the incoming channel and leave the cavity in the outgoing channel. You have to, this is an infinite sum over all possible classical trajectories. And each trajectory contributes a certain quantity that depends on its stability and its action. So, okay, this is the semi-classical theory. Knowing the S matrix, you can compute the transmission matrix, which involves now multiple sums because it was uh, the, the transmission matrix was, was quadratic in the S matrix. And now you need uh, trajectories, right? So if you want to compute scattering from here to here, you need trajectories that come from here to here. So this theory is rather complicated. It took many years to be developed. I cannot explain it, but basically can organize the theory in some diagrams that are these, basically these trajectories, how they can, you know, a certain number of trajectories can come from here to here in, diff, in, in deep possible, you know, possible different ways. And um, this semi-classical theory, what has been realized, is that you can formulate it in terms of a matrix integral. So again, without any details, there is some, this is an integration in a matrix space. So I integrate over Z, Z is a matrix. If I want to compute some function of the transmission, like the conductance, for example, what do I do? I compute the same function on ZP, Z conjugated P, where P is some projector. And I multiply it by the exponential of minus N, where N is the number of channel, uh, times this, an infinite sum of traces of powers of Z, Z star. So it's a very pretty complicated theory, okay? But the, the idea is you want to compute some transport quantity, like conductance, say. One way of doing it, which comes from the semi-classical theory, is this. You take the function you want, you multiply by something else, and you integrate over Z, where Z is a matrix. So this is a, an integral over all possible matrices Z. Okay. This is called the Geneber ensemble. Why? Because Z is a complex matrix uh, with... Um, so random elements, and the elements are Gaussian distributed and independent. This is called the Geneber ensemble. So we met several ensembles today uh, without any details, right? We talked about the circular ensembles, which are unitary matrices, Gaussian ensemble for the Hamiltonian, which is Hermitian, uh, Laguerre ensemble, inverse Laguerre ensemble, Jacobi ensemble, and now Geneber and so on. So there are several kinds of random matrices. Okay? So this is, in some sense, is like random matrix theory because I'm integrating over all possible matrices, right? But um, it's slightly different because Z is not Z is not physical. It doesn't represent any, you know, any quantum operator. It doesn't have any physics. It's just some matrix, I integrate over it and I get the result. Okay, so it's a, like a, an effective theory, but it's similar to random matrix theory in the sense that, you know, I have to integrate over a matrix space. This approach is very flexible because by changing this integral a little bit, I can incorporate energy dependence, 
I can make the X, S matrix depend on the energy. I can incorporate those tunnel barriers. And I can also do time delay calculations. So uh, in recent years, I have worked a lot on the semi-classical approximation, doing all these kinds of, uh, of calculations. And let me uh, then uh, just mention my results as, um, as I conclude this talk. Um, so in 2015, I computed statistics of time delay uh, in chaotic systems by this semi-classical approximation. In 2016, energy dependence of the S matrix in chaotic systems. This year, uh, I published a paper on the semi-classical approach to the S matrix. Uh, and also time delay. Perhaps I'm not very creative with the titles, but this, um, so these papers, they explore different aspects of these questions. Um, and I have a preprint uh, on the semi classical calculation of time delay statistics. These I have done on my own. I also have some work with students. So Pedro Bento is a student of mine and we developed together the semi classical treatment of transport with tunnel barriers just uh, last year. So this is the basically the situation. You have the quantum cavity, chaotic cavity. You have uh, waves coming in and waves going out. And you have this gray region is the tunnel barrier. With uh, Lucas Oliveira and uh, Anderson Barbosa, we have uh, considered electronic transport in three terminal chaotic systems, again with tunnel barriers. With Lucas Oliveira and Pedro Bento, we did quantum transport in chaotic cavities with tunnel barriers. Now we have two tunnel barriers. And also uh, we did with this last paper is exponentially small correction to conductance, which is a kind of a unexpected result. Uh, rather funny, let me just mention this result explicitly. So when you compute the, the, the average conductance of a chaotic cavity, when you have N1 channels in one lead and N2 channels in the other lead, the result is N1 times N2 divided by N, where N is the total number, so N1 plus N2. This is the very old result and very well-known result for average conductance. So when you include two, two tunnel barriers, and when they are exactly the same, and when the reflectivity of them is R, then you have a, a correction to this result, which is proportional to R. This is to be expected. It's like perturbation theory. And you have a second correction. And I expected, everybody expected, I think, the second correction to be quadratic in R. But it's not quadratic in R. It's proportional to the nth power of R. This is unexpected because n is the number of channels which is large and is proportional to the inverse of h bar, inverse of Planck's constant. So this is a exponentially small quantum correction. And the, the fact that we obtain this correction by a semi-classical method is very surprising because the semi-classical method is expected to be perturbative. So it should not be able to reproduce exponentially small terms. So this was a... This was a big surprise to us. Anyway, uh, I don't want to give uh, details of all these works. I uh, just want to do some propaganda. The, my idea was that the, you understand uh, what this, this, um, this, uh, this topic of quantum chaos, right? What is the impact of chaos in a quantum system? What is quantum chaotic scattering and how you can use random matrices to study uh, these problems. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, the forum is open for questions, clarifications, doubts. I think this is a bit advanced topic for graduate students. I <laughs> yeah. uh, try very hard not to give it yeah, too much mathematics. Uh, yeah. But, uh, 
for us it is a very good talk <laughs> students do you need some clarifications or doubts Hmm. No, 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 no. You are not receiving any questions. Okay. Uh, since we are not uh, receiving any questions, I, uh, I think we can conclude the session. Maybe they will write to you because they may hesitate to ask in the public. They may may write to you. That's all right. Yeah. yeah. since uh, there are no more questions i would like to conclude the session by thanking um our professor uh, marcel novios for uh, accepting our invitation and giving a very beautiful talk on quantum transports okay um uh, using uh, random matrix theory he introduced random matrix how he solves scattering problems and quantum transport using random matrix theory thank you very much sir thank you very much for accepting our invitation thank you, thank you.